Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Hey everybody, exciting whitetail season is here in Minnesota, Midwest, uh, states are opening up all across the country. It is time to finally hit the woods. We are excited. Some of us are on deer right now. Some of us might not be right now. So we're going to talk about that in this podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined by JJ Ducart and Brian Clary. I'm uh, going to talk a lot about early season, some of the bucks that we are potentially going to be chasing here uh, within the next days, um, and then strategies around that, as well as strategies coming up. Maybe if you don't have a deer to go after right now, what you're doing to prepare and getting yourself in position for maybe when those deer show up or things continue to shift. So guys, uh, what's going on? Who's got deer to hunt? Who's not? Brian, what have you been up to? I have been doing land work the week of the season. Uh, we don't really have too many mature bucks that show up on our family farm this early in the season. They're mostly out in the ag fields and, <clears throat> and, um, the area around us, I mean, we're a half mile from any ag field. So we've got the luxury of kind of getting in there later in the season and doing some of these property improvements. And over the last week and a half, we took out three acres of uh, standing timber, set up a nice tower blind uh, so my dad can hunt comfortably out of that. But then we also got some strategized uh, tree stand placements around that big open field now. And I got that all planted. Everything's cleaned up. It's a huge area and we are really excited to hunt it this year. But we... We have been seeing this buck the last couple of years. I don't have any mature bucks on the property right now. This one buck has showed up mid to end of October every year. So I am passing up every buck I can see coming in up until then just to hopefully get my eyes on him because we do know that he made it through the winter. So kind of like a patience game, you know, I, I yeah. can remember if you guys, anybody out there has watched uh, the hunt breakdown um, Minnesota monster from a couple of years ago, I had a similar situation where it was an 80 acre piece of property. And I want to break down your property a little bit, but it was an 80 acre piece that it was same, same kind of thing. Like I never had a lot of mature bucks on there early. JJ, I know your guys' property sets up a little like that. Like I, I know we'll get into your property, but never really had mature bucks, but two, three years in a row, this deer, he showed up during the rut every single year. And that's, that's when we'd get him. There was a week long where he spent on his, on that farm. And if you watch that hunt breakdown, that was the strategy that I used to go in there and kill that deer because I knew or was banking on history repeating itself and using that to my advantage and was able to go in there and kill him during that week that he was on the property. So, you know, for you, I would say, you don't you're, you're not focused on a mature buck maybe this weekend, nope. but you're kind of anticipating the future. So let's jump into your property a little bit. How big is it and how does it kind of set up? So it's 40 acres. We hunt basically all ridge tops. Uh, everything falls down into some lower valleys on all sides of the property. Um, there's minimal, like I said, there's minimal ag around. There's minimal water. So we've dropped in ponds up on this top section. Really is able to hold the, especially the does, which is good right now. Because when you got those does feeling secure in that, that top section right there, it is key for when the bucks actually do start moving in then they will feel comfortable following those does those does are bedded up in their little cells and they they can kind of meander around the property as they please and if we got the minimal human pressure at this time of the year they they're not going anywhere they've got plenty of food from our food plots they've got the uh the water the water sources and then good easy transition trails to and from some of the lower the lower valleys down below so your strategy right now, I would assume, you know, you said you were doing land work even this last week. So I would imagine at this point, you know, it's time to stay out, you know, let the reveals do the work for you. And then, you know, are you basically relying on them and some history to tell you, okay, now it's time to hunt or will you go and have some spot sits or you're just going to stay out? I do have some spots that I can sit here early season, just more as observation stands to watch where they're coming in and out of the property, um, kind of staying off of those what I like to call your A spots, you know, staying out of those stands, but where you can visibly see the deer moving into those spots from a distance. Yeah. JJ, what do you got? Yeah. Quick comment on Brian's property. Um, <clears throat> I think your property is going to just get stronger throughout the year because you have been kind of intrusive right now. You put in a big food plot that yep. needs to sprout and actually mature still quite a bit. Um, and then the, that pond you put in needs to fill up. So luckily we have a lot of rain warm weather right now early in the season yep. that's going to help you out 
Um, and I should just get better with time. So that's, yeah, one, one kind of thing there. Yeah. And w one other point on that, we wouldn't have been doing this project that we did if we didn't see the extended forecast. And that's one thing that we were keying in on is we've got two and a half weeks right now of 70 to 80 degree weather where we can go in and plant some of those later cover crops it's doing two things. It's giving the deer nutrition for this fall, attracting, uh, attracting them to the property. And then also, uh, suppressing the weed growth in that newly opened up field for next spring because when they come back up, when the soil starts to warm, it's going to really blanket that top and not really allow for any of the weeds to outcompete it. Yeah, for sure. And then um, <clears throat> just starting to think at other properties too. Yeah, I'm not really on anything I'm extremely excited about. Um, running the reveals actually today, a big shipment of the lithium reveal. Um, battery cartridges came in. So that's one thing that I'm going to implement here. A lot of the batteries I've been using have, you know, just kind of scrounging through the winter, uh, the summer, trying to get through old batteries and testing them and save a couple bucks because battery prices are ridiculous right now. But um, getting those cartridges in and, and hopefully that's going to be the key to just setting these cameras up, letting them roll through October, November, December. Hopefully those those packs last for a long time. Yeah, that's going to be my next kind of move is is more cameras, activate more cameras and put a couple out this week on a spot that I haven't been to all year and saw some good sign. I mean, a lot of white acorns were dropping. Um, and then I kind of, I actually set the camera up on the, on a field edge there under some big white oaks and little, little did I know, I actually pointed it right at a, like a primary scrape and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, as I'm walking back to the truck, Hey, there's a big scrape right in front of the camera. Cause it's just so thick couldn't quite see it but yeah some sign popping up um trying to get on some bigger box there's some deer that we've been watching in that four or five range but nothing that like you know blows your socks off or anything so kind of the patient game is is the the game i'm playing too and you know we got a lot of rain coming up which is really nice because then i'm going to actually slide in on certain wind conditions do a couple stand tweaks like a little bit of trimming or um, i'm actually going to bring some fabric tape or hockey tape in and take a couple of squeaks out of some spots that I can remember from last year before things get too wild. Um, but yeah, just kind of getting ready. Nothing, nothing on the radar that I'm, I'm too excited about. So just trying to be patient. What about you? I, I'm in a little different boat, actually. It's, it's crazy. I feel like the season has snuck up on us a little bit. It just got back from Nevada here uh, yesterday or the day before, and I feel like I'm behind the eight ball a little bit. I mean, we, we did so much work moving into the season, you know, here within the last few months, and now it's like, boom, fast forward, and it's here. Um, but been running the reveals out there, and, and on my property, we do have a lot of ag. We have some a lot of beans this year, um, and we do seem to have a, a quite a crop of really good deer. So Last year, the last day of the season, um, I filmed 13 different bucks that were, you know, solid up and comers. Um, and we're really starting to see that age structure now this year. Um, so we have quite a few four year olds around. Um, what we're trying to do now is really dive into okay, are, what deer should we try to take advantage of or what deer shouldn't we? You know, there's there's a couple good four year olds that, that are on our property that are really, really nice. And, uh, you know, they're, they've reached that level of maturity really great scorn deer, which, you know, the score thing we've talked about in a lot of podcasts, it's not a real, uh, important thing to me necessarily. Like, sure. Everybody wants to shoot a good score deer, but you know, we, we want to shoot that, that upper age class maturity level for me. Um, <clears throat> I like chasing a deer that when I look at him, um, I, I can see that he's reached that peak maturity. You know, he's got, you can see it not only in his rack, but you can see it in his face. You can see it in his body. And that, that's what trips my trigger. You know, you look at some of these upper age structure deer like skyscraper or beamer. And, you know, it's just like you look at him and you see him and you feel it, that heavy, gnarly, right. old mature buck. Um, a couple of these deer are starting to get it. Um, I would like to, we're playing that game right now. It's like, okay, well, <clears throat> do they quite have that yet? Do you, try to go after him? Do you try to let him go? You know, that's, that's a big thing on our property. We, we do hold a lot of deer year after year, but we do have neighbors that, that you know, obviously take advantage of that too. Um, so I, I try not to get caught up in that game of, well, should I shoot him or is he going to make it or whatever? I try to, you know, we try to, as a group and all the guys that, that hunt with me on, on this piece of property, you know, try to manage it the best that we can and in, in hopes for continuing to 
to have year after year success. Um, so I do have quite a few bucks on right now. I think that uh, uh, two of them in particular will be um, target bucks and, and could potentially go after them this weekend. Um, I know that we have a kind of hidden bean field um, and a lot of deer coming out in there. There's a couple of shooters coming out in there, but it's a tough spot to hunt. Um, we have some south winds, it looks like, this weekend. Um, and, you know, I, I'm weighing the options here. We have a couple of stand placements and there's a couple that I could get into, but I know the wind is really, really tough there. You're going to have limited opportunity because you have two options. The wind's either blowing into their bedroom or it's blown out into the beans. So you have to almost give up something. So you have to be really careful and pick your windows when you go in there because sure you could blow your wind out in the beans, but then as the deer get out there, they're going to get you. You obviously don't want it blown into their bedroom and, and cut your foot off before you even have a start. So Again, it's about access there too. So as important as access is going in, like you need access to get out. This is a destination food source for these deer. So, you know, it's like, okay, when you, when I go in there, I want to really have a high, the highest percentage chance to kill the deer right away that first night, because I know that it's going to be tough for me to get out. What a strategy that I, I'm really considering here is, um, uh, a hang and hunt situation, where I go in, um, there's a, a south fence line that I can get in. Now, what my reveals are telling me is that these deer are quite a ways away, you know, 100 or so yards away from this south fence line. But if I do get a north wind, which we might get next week, um, I can hunt that south wind, at least go in and observe. I might be a hair off the mark, but I can get in there undetected, kind of see what's going on, lay eyes, you know, face to face with these deer, really get that, that gauge on them then um, versus what I'm just seeing on camera. So kind of instead of diving in right away, full blown and, and just risking blowing them out, going more with a, an ease in tactic, little observation, see if I can lay eyes on them, see what they're doing, get out clean, um, and go from there. So it's a, it's an exciting time, I guess, early for me now, the clock's ticking too, like beans are turning, you know, yellow. So the more that they turn yellow and yellow, the more that those patterns are going to shift a little bit. Um, but it's more of that weighing option game and it, it's a, it's a fun game to play. Um, so we'll kind of see there's, there's lots of, lots of variables that always come into play there. Yeah. And the good thing for you, and I think, I think it'll play out like this, but if you don't get that crack early, I think that main core part of your, your, the property you're talking about is big enough to where you're going to get that early season and you're still going to get the same deer in the rut. Hopefully, you know, some of the deer do leave and go to different properties and stuff, but you know, depending on if it's a small property, you might just get that one crack and you better take advantage of it or you, you know you're you're done for the year so i think you got yeah you want to kind of take your time be careful because you don't want to blow it up right away because yeah. you may get another crack at a different phase of, of the rut or something too you know yeah that's a great point fortunately it seems like in in the years that we've hunted this property our deer don't really leave i mean they'll venture off obviously but like they might move parts of the farm, but there's lots of kind of deep valleys in this property and lots of timber that we rarely ever, and during the hunting season, we don't go in. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have kind of a lot of what you'd call sanctuary areas here um, that our deer feel comfortable there. It's it's big enough. This main section is like 400 acres, so it's big enough to hold them there. Um, so they're there a lot of the year. It's not kind of a feast or famine situation, which, ha which happens a lot. Um, you know, like you guys have talked about a little bit, your guys deer move in during the rut. We're fortunate to have those crops early. Now, as those crops change and they get harvested, those deer will move. Um, but we have the opportunity to kind of hold them there. And it, and it, it does just like any property too, gets better, you know, throughout the season. And even, you know, the hard thing here <clears throat> too is late season. You know, when you look at late season, we spend so much time, you guys, putting in food plots and really focusing on these food sources for not just early and middle of the season, but late season. And Minnesota can be so darn good. Late season is one of my favorite times to hunt because it's like the last day of the season last year. Film 13 bucks that are, you know, two, three years old, a couple four-year-olds. So, you know, late season can be so key, you know, and, and deer patternable when you have cold temperatures and snow, especially here in Minnesota, that drives them to food sources if you got them, they're going to be there. So, you know, lots of opportunity. Um, you know, we try not to, to get too excited early. Um, 
but you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. We just, you mentioned getting the lithium batteries in and, and doing that, you know, we're, we're kind of gear prepping, doing some new things for this year. We just got a big shipment of, of Osseo gear in here, uh, to the, to the shop, um, that we were going through this morning and in the, in the past weeks or so. Um, so really excited to be wearing Osseo this year. Um, we tested out a little bit last year and had a lot of success, really like the pattern and, and the design, um, really impressed with that. So trying some different, uh, garments this year, some more early season stuff, um, which is kind of exciting. So really just going through that scent control regiment and getting everything prepped as much as it's here, not getting too excited at this point. Right. And this is the time of the year that you really, really have to focus on the scent control. If you're going in the timber at all, you need to be scent, scent free. Um, I mean, even the work that we've been doing over the last week, we've been trying to minimize that staying on either the machines or getting, I mean, when you're putting your hands on your cameras, whatever it is, wiping them down with our, uh, field foam, stuff like that. So just not leaving that trace behind you, especially when these new animals are coming into these smaller properties. Yeah. And even this morning I, on the reveal, I get a picture of a newer buck. I think I had him a month or two ago. So I would consider it new buck as it moved in for the first time. Um, but yeah, with all this moisture coming in, these new bucks, you know, shifting a little bit, there's just good. I mean, it's going to be hard to keep human odor from, you know, being detectable to the deer just because that moisture is going to be high. I don't know what the forecast looks like, but I think it's like yeah. five or so days of rain in the next 10, 14 day forecast, well, pretty high up there. And not only that, we've got these warmer days and then the cooler yeah, evenings hot. that drop down to the, I mean, we're going from 80 to 40 degrees and you get that fog settling in the morning. And when, if you're out during a morning hunt, your odor molecule is attached to all those hydrogen molecules in the air and that will make you so much more detectable to the deer. So you, yeah. I mean, this is the time that you really got to be focusing on it. Yeah. And without getting too far off topic here on that, yeah. but yeah, like, <laughs> um, on those real wet days, calm is bad. If you can get a little breeze, you know, wait for a window, just be patient. Don't, don't go in there on a calm. If you look at your forecast or your app or whatever it may be, you're looking at, if it says calm or one or two mile an hour, maybe we pick another day <laughs> you know it's it's interesting when you, when you talk about that a little bit too thermals come into play there and you know a, a lot of people have heard about thermals and how they work in the morning and the evening and out in nevada it was interesting i was when we were out there elk hunting you know we were putting a stock on this one bull in particular and we started in the morning and it was dark and, and the wind was kind of pulling down off this big mountain and it's open area and there's big mountains so like you can really pay attention you're checking the wind the whole way in and you can really see it's like in an instant that those thermals switch. And it was really cool to see that and kind of document that out there. So wind's kind of blowing down. So we're, we're below this bull and we're stocking in or at least in parallel with them. And as soon as that sun peaks, uh, I mean, like within a minute of that sun coming up, you could see it wind checker, you know, wind floater, poof. And that wind starts sucking up. Those thermals are pulling it right up the mountain. Same thing in the evening. You know, like your wind can be blowing one direction, that sun goes down and those thermals start pulling down. So really understanding, you know, your thermals. And I, it's, it was one interesting thing that they, those, those guys out there were using um, was Onyx to detect those wind directions. And even, you know, there's no service out there. So they had all their offline maps downloaded and everything. And you could even, when you dropped a waypoint, you were getting real-time updates on this wind direction. So you could click on that waypoint. It would give you wind information on that spot. And it was interesting because it wasn't going off of what the weather was saying. It was also, a lot of the time we noticed it was taking account for those thermals, which was really, really cool and a cool feature within that app. You wouldn't think that, you'd think it would just go off the weather service. Um, but it was really pretty accurate if you click on those waypoints and go into wind indicator or wind direction within that Onyx app that it was showing you, you know, you could be two miles away and click on a waypoint in, you know, this canyon or ditch. And it was really pretty accurate actually on some of those wind directions and having that information like real time was crucial, especially when you're spotting and stalking like that. So, you know, whether it's a damp day or, or a windy day or whatever, just pay attention to those thermals. Um, in the morning and evening and understand what they're doing. Um, JJ, let's get into talking about, so morning versus evening hunting early season. Um, you know, are you just hunting evenings? Are there any situations that you would hunt mornings? Um, what's your thoughts there? I used to hunt a lot of mornings early season and then 
I decided not to and had more success. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I used to burn out spots pretty good early season hunting mornings. Um, now I'm just more patient, but also hunting different deer, different caliber of deer, kind of different strategy than back when I used to do that. I think a common strategy among some of the top hunters, if you talk to them, is just, you know, late seat, um, evening hunts throughout pretty much all early season is the way to go. If you got something to chase, don't just go hunt to hunt. Um, use the intel and then move in on the evenings if you can. And then as, you know, the pre-rut starts to kick in, you know, then then ship in the mornings. I know it's different everywhere, so that's kind of a, a blanket statement, but pretty much I'm staying out in the mornings for quite a while here. Brian, what do you think? I'm the same way. I hardly hunt any mornings during the early season. Once, like JJ was saying, once that pre-rut kicks in and you really, I mean, you you start hearing a move when you're sitting in the dark in the mornings and typically i mean what i've noticed is you'll get a lot more rut activity in the morning as well well i can tell you i i it's hard because it's always exciting like opening day comes and you're right. like it's time to go and you know there's something there's that feeling of waking up in the woods and um or, or you know watching the woods wake up and getting in there in the morning and yeah i mean that's it it's it's i think it's more effective, efficient, smarter to just hunt evenings. Um, I do think there's a few situations where, um, you can get in, in the mornings, but I will tell you just because you're getting maybe reveal information that, that there's daylight bucks doesn't mean you can get in there and hunt them. You know, interestingly enough, last year we were hunting this inside corner in the back of a cornfield and I had a reveal there and almost every morning, the week of the season leading up to it, you know, there was a shooter buck in this one corner in the daylight in the morning. And it's like, man, we should be in there hunting. Now, interestingly enough, I had a camera about 150 yards away, closer to the road that would access it from. And those bucks were there in the dark there. Now, if I didn't have those two cameras set up like that, I wouldn't know that. But I, I looked at it and said, man, there's no way that you could get into this spot in the morning without blowing those deer out first. So I came up with this grand scheme. I'm like, well, okay, I can backdoor them. So I actually went in the week before and marked a trail on my Onyx through the standing cornfield, right through the middle of it, understanding where the deer were coming from. So I could get to that stand, but I had to walk through standing corn, walk all the way and then walk the back edge. And I'm like, you know, that's a pretty good idea. But then when it came down to it, it was like, is it worth that risk? Cause you're still, you're walking through the standing cornfield in the dark, you're making a bunch of noise. You know, it was like, okay, just sit back and be patient. I never went in there in the morning. Um, and I think you just have such better odds cause deer are going back to bed so early. It's hot. They're not moving real far. They're bedding close to where they last are at, at that, that first light. Um, so not saying don't hunt in the mornings. I think there's certain spots that you can get to if you can get there clean then go ahead and hunt in the morning. I just know that it's a lot tougher to get into spots without blowing deer in the morning this time of year. Yeah, there was two years ago, I was trying some early season first week type morning stuff because of some intel, but that was also more of a uh, that bulletproof access, you know, windier morning, which is not common. You know, usually it's pretty calm that first half hour, hour, but, you know, a couple of days where it was a strong enough wind to where I had a little bit of noise covering my entry and felt like I could get in. It was just kind of a fence line transition, like easy in, easy out. Didn't really, felt like it didn't hurt, you know, to, to try it early as a surprise. Um, didn't get the job done. The buck actually a couple of times I'd check the camera after I would head out from the morning sit and the buck was there like 20 minutes before I got there. So it was, it was close, like, but just didn't quite close the deal. So there's, there's opportunity. I mean, you see people all the time smash a big buck early season opening morning type thing and so it's it's not like you can't do it it's just yeah do you want to take away a good evening opportunity with you know busting them up in the morning well it's and also the oppor- reward i mean also the opportunity that we have in the upper midwest right now we've got 70 percent of the bucks with shed velvet you know we get out there and you might have a chance at a velvet buck opening day are you, are you still seeing a lot of velvet bucks in camera? Um, I would say about 70% of them are uh, showing hard antler now, but there are still a few holding on to it. A lot of the younger bucks, I guess, are the ones that are still holding it from what I've seen. We did have the world record velvet buck shot in our town like 20 years ago. So it's possible. I don't no. even know if I knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
Nice. That's I don't, awesome. It doesn't stand anymore, but it was yeah. probably 15 years ago. I know down, you know, down South, Kentucky is open. Kansas is open. There's a lot of those Southern states that are open now and guys are shooting velvet bucks and yeah. Joe Miles is out there laying them down. And I think he's got three bucks under his belt already. Mile, all velvet. Yeah. Lucky so guy. He's, he's off to a rock and start. So he that's is. cool. It's, it'll be exciting to, to have him on and, and, uh, doing some hunt breakdowns this year off to a, a rock and start. Um, obviously deer study hunt breakdowns are, are going now on YouTube. Yep. Um, been some cool ones, Brian, um, had a your hunt breakdown aired last week, yep. and uh, that was a pretty powerful one. You uh, you had quite the season last year. Do you want to just give everybody a little tease into what? Yeah, what that... that one. I mean, <laughs> that's a little deeper for a hunt breakdown for sure. I our family had a heck of a year last year. Um, my mother had passed in April of 2021, and then in September of 2021, my dad had a widowmaker heart attack that luckily enough, and we are so blessed that he is still here, but he, my sister did CPR on him for eight minutes and I mean, hundred percent saved his life while well, the paramedics got there, shocked him, but kind of the hunt breakdown is kind of a recap on our year and the power of the outdoors, the healing power of the outdoors. And it, it was a, it was a really special hunt and we got it, uh, we got it documented pretty well as far as how the, how this, how the, not only the season, but the year, the preparation, all that went down on the building into what the hunt breakdown was for the actual harvest last year. Well, that, that hunt breakdown is called a reflection mm -hmm. and you know, it's pretty cool because I think it really exemplifies what hunting does for us outside of just shooting big bucks, right? Like we all love chasing mature whitetails and obviously you guys yeah. create tools to make you more effective and, and make that experience better. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's almost, uh, uh, it's about the experience and what those moments in the, in the woods, you know, you had the, well, maybe the worst year of your life or the hardest, well, yeah, hardest, sure. hardest times <laughs> of your life. And, you know, you were able to gain some peace, um, mm -hmm. from just being out there in, in the woods. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a reason they call it tree stand therapy. It's, it is. Yeah. So coming up, JJ, I mean, what, you know, whitetails from scratch property don't necessarily have a target buck, um, that you're looking at right now or some of the other properties that you hunt. So what's your strategy kind of moving into this opening week now and, and what's going to change for you to make you say, okay, it's time to hunt. Yeah. And it, there may be a target buck there. I'm just not running as many cameras as, as we could. Um, but like I said, battery cartridges are in and we're ready to rock coming up. <laughs> um, so they may be in there. It's just going to be hard to get in there and set the cameras and not try to blow it up. So just be real careful and pick windows, even to do camera stuff like that. But yeah, just kind of wait. You just never know. I mean, this time of the year, just it's the waiting game. I, it's like every day I look at my phone and I go back one year and I'm like, when did they show up? When did they show up? When did they show up? Like, did I miss it? Did I, you know, so just keep looking back at last year. When did this buck show up? When did this happen? And I, it's like, it just mirrors what you feel like is going to happen. And it's, and that's the reason why I've shot a couple of different bucks. You just look, keep looking back, keep looking back. What happened? Um, cause those bucks, they, they love to slide into certain areas and kind of take it over during certain times. It's, it seems fairly predictable. If you let them do it, you don't disrupt them. So kind of waiting for that to happen at the uh, whitetail from scratch property. Um, as far as a couple other spots I'm hunting, just kind of waiting on some big ones to show up. That's more, you know, rut oriented and then over in Wisconsin, um, couple, couple bucks that, I don't know. It's weird. They're both five. I think we're going to throw Andre as a five. Um, I just don't know. Just, just not, not sure about it yet. They're walking around. It's at night. So I'm not going to just act on a nighttime video or anything, but, right. um, just undecided. Just be patient. That's the that's, that's the name the of the game this year. year. Yeah, we'll yeah. be patient. This year, I, I'm in the exact same boat with that. Yeah, you know the buck I'm talking about. It's actually one that's been on buck nuggets when it was a three and a half year old just flattening a decoy. You, you're, after my brother and I had taken out nugget. on our family, is that what we got? buck nugget? Yeah, yeah, the buck nugget. Um, <laughs> but. We, yeah, we set up that decoy on him when he was a three and a half year old, flattened that decoy, I mean, handful of times after we were tagged out just to see kind of its reaction to it. And then he showed back up last year as a four and a half year old, four and a half year old, and boy, did he ever make a leap. And we know that he's alive coming into this season. 
shows up right around that October 30th point. So unless if there is something extremely special that shows up between now and then, that has got my name all over it, and I am going to be holding out on every deer unless if <laughs> – Unless if a couple of them bet you over from Lemke's farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now. That's like 35 miles. I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the cool part about that is, is, you know, like even your, your, some of your deer over there in Wisconsin, you know, we, we get so much intel from these cameras now. I mean, right yeah. at our fingertips. And that's so cool. And it gives us such a, um, you know, one, an advantage, but two, you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, you can kind of, it's, it's like you're living through that. Even for my wife who, you know, is not, she's fairly new to hunting. I mean, she, she shot her first buck last year and, um, but like she, she loves that. She loves looking at the app. My yeah. boys love looking at the app. Like it's, it's so exciting as much as it gives you an advantage. It's still hunting. Right. I mean, what? No, just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's still hunting and, and yeah. that Intel as valuable as it is. It's still just outside intel you know these bucks i think you you have to get out there and it's like we talked about earlier you got to lay eyes on them you know to really see that and get that emotional kind of feel you know it's maybe one of those things you get out there you see andre it's like you're gonna know like should i shoot him should i not shoot him you're gonna get that feeling and there's something to be said about that it's like i love running my reveals i and and i'll continue to do so uh like here on my farms in minnesota or, or the farms we lease and you know, rarely, I think now it happens, but rarely am I super surprised, uh, you know, going out there, unless it's the rut on a buck that shows up that I'm not aware of. Right. It happens, but not every sit. Now I go down to Kansas and totally different story. Like I'm on different area. I'm, uh, and, and that's kind of cool. You know, you, that feeling of unknown and that feeling of, look, just go out there. If a buck gets you excited, you're going to kill it. Right. Or you're going to try to, um, that's why we do what we do. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see, I, I think we all kind of have different opinions on that Andre deer. Um, just a, a stud of a deer, um, you know, but you're playing that game too. Like, should we let him live? Should we, you know, try to get him one more year? I'll be interested to see what you do when you have him in front of you. I, I am going to place a, a I, I would bet anybody right now that you're going to see probably a, a hunt breakdown that with Andre yeah. the Giant in it come yeah. next fall but we'll see i would have to imagine so yeah I was, well i'll tell you why i was laughing earlier is because you said your kids love looking at the app mine are like sick of looking at deer photos all the time they're <laughs> like i don't want to look at these photos anymore because i'm always on the app but so that's good that your kids yeah look at the app. <laughs> oh i got a two-year-old little man at home and he every time my phone buzzes he deer 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 <laughs> But yeah, back to Andre, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to juggle that one a little bit. Cause we didn't know if he, if, is he four or is he five? Like what's the potential you look at a deer that's kind of special and it's like, what could he be? I know you're kind of battling that with a deer right now. You showed us this morning, like next year he's going to look pretty good, but at the same time it's tough. Cause then last year I passed up a buck in Wisconsin, a four year old and he was not a good genetic buck at all. I uh, passed him up cause a, a bigger buck showed up on camera surprised deer and then had him at 10 had this four and a half year old at 10 yards passed him up well now this year he shows up five year old big dominant buck and his rack went down like he got worse so that was a mistake that i should have pulled the trigger on so it's like you just never know that's what's hard until you're in that seat and making that decision you know because there's other deer in the back of your mind that could show up during the rut and trying to be patient but you know you only get so many opportunities so it's it's hard well, yeah, and especially if we're talking about early season right now, we had a hunt breakdown a couple of weeks ago get released, Greg Towner's early season buck, and he explains it really well as far as early season right now, you get those deer pinpointed. He had that thing down to, I mean, he knew what trail it was coming out on at what time every night he was scouting it from a two, 300 yards away and watching that deer for a week straight prior to the season opening. And I mean, early season is, in my opinion, if you've got the property, you've got the buck on the property, the best time to get out there and pattern a deer. If you got them on those late season, summer feeding patterns, at least. Yep, early yeah. and late. Yeah, yep. sure, it surely can be. And that's the, that's the beauty of those times is they're patternable. You know, they're kind of doing that same thing. Now we're going to, talked about shifts, you know, last podcast, 
we're going to see another shift in that pattern, you know, as food sources start to change and testosterone levels start to change and temperatures and all those things. But they can be, I mean, right now, that's right, same trail, but yet you just be careful. Again, it's about not only getting in there, it's about if you don't kill them, getting out of there. I mean, it's very delicate too, because you go in and jack up that summer pattern pretty quick. You know, those big bucks are smart and you may only have one crack at them early. It could be a really high percentage one. Um, but, you know, just pay attention to your wind. You yeah. know, pick a, pick you a good, have good weather window. Bulletproof access in and out for sure. Yeah. And like you mentioned earlier, these beans are turning so fast that things are changing quick. Acorns are dropping bucks. I, had, I haven't had a picture of Andre actually without velvet. He was a velvet, velvet, velvet. He held it late last week, still velvet, and then disappeared. So he must have, you know, done that where they shed and kind of disappear for a little stretch of time here. Um, but yeah, just driving around yesterday, it was like one bean field brown and yellow. The next one's bright green still just, you know, prime for another two, three weeks. So depending on when the farmer planted, things are changing. They might shift to a different field. They might just, you know, be tucked in on a green edge of a bean field where it's just a little bit left uh, to eat at night. <clears throat> but and then they're going to be shifting into the acorns and into the greens and into our plots and, you know, hopefully doing what, we uh, plan the whole habitat strategy for so yep. everything's changing quick they're gonna need water coming up well maybe not quite soon because there's it's gonna rain a lot and there's a lot of moisture in the plants but soon that water will have a better attraction you know the drier it gets um the more green starts to brown up and things like that so it's just a constant change and it's getting exciting yeah yeah, yeah their, their palette's definitely starting to change Yep. We're seeing more and more on the green fields, I mean, every night. And those acorns I saw the other day, that just piles of them. It got me so excited. And yeah. I don't even know if there's a, a buck in there. I mean, there was a scrape and, you know, some acorns. little bucks maybe using it. But, man, <clears throat> those acorns yeah. got me super excited. Just yeah. piles of them. So got the reveal sitting out there. and Yeah, yeah I saw acorns dropping in our neighbor's yard the other day, and I was just like, whew. It's gets time. you excited. Yeah, it's you time. just hear them <laughs> yeah. hitting cars. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that that's a huge draw and a huge changer for like deer that are on, you know, big ag fields early. I mean, those acorns start to drop and they are dropping right now. Yep. But those acorn flats can be just killer. And and the nice thing about that is if you can, if you find where those acorn flats are, whether it's on an edge or even back there, if you can get to them, those mature bucks have a tendency to feel comfortable back in those, in the, in the timber, in those acorn flats. So you like even... And I'm sure we'll do some podcasts on this coming up, but like that October lull period. Yeah. Now there's all kinds of different opinions out there. I think the October lull is not real. Don't say it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't say I, I don't believe in the October lull. No. But I, I feel like during that time, late September, um, you know, early October, those can be really good and you can get mature bucks on their feet during daylight because they feel comfortable in there. You know, they're not exposed a lot of the time. Um, and if you can get into those spots, pay attention to those acorns because more than not, like deer are going to be there. Yeah. And you just think about what are deer doing right now here? And I, I can only speak to our area. I can't speak to Southern States or other areas, but <clears throat> you know, they're still on these egg fields. They're not in this thick timber where we got hinge cut, thick bedding. They can't move through that. Like they're not using that at all. So we're just kind of waiting for that shift. You know, when the leaves start to drop and things open up, but yeah, like if a buck is kind of staging in an oak flat, like understory's open. It's not like he's got to fight his way through and kind of, you know, if he's got velvet, ruin his velvet. So it's just wide open. There's food there. I mean, you can probably, it's probably in a good bedding area. I mean, it's just, there's just different areas that they like throughout the year now, late season, or, you know, just think of November, that same oak flat, you'd be able to see 200, 300 yards in that area. And it's not a good security or he can see you coming or so. That's yeah, just things change so fast and just keeping up on that. It's just, that's the fun part of, of the season. It's just this whole change and all the shifts and, you know, predicting, trying to predict what's going to happen next using the weather. I don't know what we want to dive into next, but weather is always an intriguing topic this yes. time of the year too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are you looking for weather wise when you're, when you're going on early season, what's something that you look for a combination of things that you look for to create that window? Yeah, and I'm going to even pull up my phone looking just so we can right give now. you a real time. But, I mean, early season, you're looking for higher barometric pressure spikes. Right before those rainstorms coming in and out, um, 
the cool air coming in, the cool air going out, the barometric pressure rising, the barometric pressure falling. But you always want to have it at that higher point in the earlier season. Well, at least you're going to find them a lot more on their feet during daylight hours during those times. Yeah, I mean, just right now we got, you know, for opener here in Minnesota, Wisconsin, 17th of September, 80 degrees, 36 percent chance of rain i mean 83 again 82 85 wednesday 69 to thursday 62 so you're just looking at that big drop coming up after all that rain you know i don't know how heavy this rain's going to be but if it's a big heavy long rain the deer aren't moving they're just kind of <clears throat> pinned down for a long time you get a little cold front you know maybe the rain stops they're going to be on their feet right after that rain and i know brian you were doing tons of velvet scouting last year a little bit less this year but yep. those days when it rained and stopped i mean you're out there just every day killing the yeah. footage on those deer so i mean after that rain it's huge yeah it seems like the if you get some rain in the morning and then it starts to clear and you get that sun popping out and you kind of get that that high pressure it gets nice again i think deer a lot like not to humanize them but i i think they're a lot like us in the sense that like you feel it when it's rainy and drizzly and you know we think of those big buck killing days that are like you know overcast and kind of nasty and i think there's a lot to be said about that when we move later in the season but like early, I like hunting the sunny days, you know, where your pressure's high or after it's, uh, you know, done raining and the sun comes out, those deer, I think they feel that too. Um, and they want to move. I will say this about the hot days too. Sometimes I think we get in the, the mindset of, ah, oh, it's too hot. I'm not going to go. When you look at early season, those, that first week, for example, you got to think about, you've seen these deer all summer long and they're, they're going out to feed. Like, I don't mind hunting an overly hot day. Now it's tough. You know, you got to use your field foam and be on top of your scent control. I don't mind hunting those hot days like that first week. If you have sun, I think those deer are just on that pattern and it still can be really, really good. I mean, lots of guys kill big bucks on a 90 degree day, you know, here in the Midwest and it's same with Kansas and whatever else. I So I wouldn't let hot days necessarily deter you. I'd look at the pressure. Obviously, if you have a window where the temperature is going to drop like it does, you know, that's a great time to, to look at, uh, you know, either end of that. Uh, obviously, the back end of it, I think, is, is always a little better than the front end, maybe. Um, you know, but that those rainy, cloudy days, not saying that they're not going to move, but those, those high pressure, the sunny days, those days that, you know, you feel good, you know, are, I think, good days to be out there hunting. Well, you, you made a good point, too, on the end or on the back side of those weather changes with the cold, well, with the rain, we... We're in Minnesota. We sometimes, I mean, I've seen snow in the beginning of October before here. But when you get those cold shifts, when it's cold for two, three, four days, it's raining, it's putting down snow, whatever it might be, and then it, you get that sunny day at the back end of it. Those deer, they want to feel comfortable. They want to warm their bodies up. They want to get back out and refill or refuel their depleted bodies, I guess, from not feeding for a couple of days. Not to say they're not feeding, but they're not feeding on their normal uh patterns yeah and i totally agree with lemke on that sunny day compared to the cloudy day early season um you should just drive around a lot before wife and kids and all the stuff that goes along with that um just at night just drive all the time looking for deer spotting yeah. filming um even back a long time ago i used to have a three ring binder every hunt i would document my hunt my you know the weather how many deer i'd see <laughs> Um, I wish I still had that, but yeah, no, I, the sunny day seemed like deer would flood out into those fields way quicker than when it was like a cloudy overcast, even cool. I just couldn't understand why. And then let's just listen to podcasts a couple of years ago. I think Mark Drew even hit on that, like seemed like the sunny days on, on his, um, research and, you know, documentation or whatever studies. Yeah. The sunny days, the deer would come out earlier than those cloudy days. And like you said, I think it also can flip and be better cloudy during the rut because yes. they're going from that you know it's real dry they're trying to pick up a hot dough and now you maybe have some moisture coming in with the clouds so it gives a buck a little bit better advantage to you know find a doe if you can actually smell her from longer off or downwind of her or pick up her trail so kind of different for the time of the year but yeah like this time of the year a nice just a little cool front you know pressure rising uh temperature dropping a little bit but keeping that sunny day not too windy not too calm like just middle of the road um, those are dynamite. So though that's like the day that I'd be looking to go out, um, put a first couple sits in some good spots in the evening. 
Yeah, in the evening. And, yes. and you know, it comes down to an instinctual thing almost. Like Mike always says, JJ, you just have this instinct on where you got to be. And I think there's some days where you just like you feel it, you know, you, you, you're, get, you have, you're getting all this into all the time and you're looking at your weather and you've got all these tools and there's all these things out there. And like, so there's so many days that it's just like, you're looking at it and you're like, okay, yeah, things are lining up, but I just feel it. You know, like you feel like you got to be out there and you feel it. And I, it's the, look, the pressure and the weather, it affects you as a person too, like as a human living on this planet. And I think like sometimes when it hits you like that and you're like, man, I just got to be out there. So many times you hear guys talk about like, I just knew, you know, and I think you have to really, as stupid as it may sound, like you have to pay attention to that a little bit because I think that it's maybe having that same impact on deer movement as well, as crazy as that may sound, but, you know, pay attention to your instincts because I think that could play a big role. Well, and I remember last year, the night that I shot that buck that's on the hunt breakdown that we re released last week, I texted both of you guys earlier in that afternoon and I knew all three of us were sitting that night and I was like, there's going to be a deer that dies tonight. I can feel that. And within an hour of that, I think I sent you another picture of a bloody arrow. Well, there's been a couple of years right. of that. The two years ago is the one I was thinking about for your buck. You shot come throat punch. That was oh, a good yeah. buck. <laughs> um, I just knew somebody, and I think you were in the stand too. We were all texting. Yeah. I believe so. But I mean, it was just prime. Like yeah. it was going down. Somebody was killing that night. It was just yeah. that high pressure. Cool. I, would, I knew what the date was. Was that Ooh, October 10th, early October. Yeah. Like, a, I mean, it was just phenomenal day yeah. and Brian, he, t he texts us early bloody arrow. So I always like texting you guys bloody arrow. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that one was, that, that was, one, that was a brutal kill. <laughs> that was quite the deal. This deer comes very, up. Very, very quick. Yeah. Very Big quick. Deal comes up and I always give Brian crap. I'm like, well, that's, I, I mean, honestly, it's not really a producible hunt cause it was so graphic, but that's something that I've learned from. I mean, tremendously. That was three years ago. Was it three? Yeah, it was three years ago. But I've learned from that so much just because I was getting around. I was leaning way out on my stand. And as soon as I was drawn back, I had that last little notch when I had it, had the pin on his shoulder. And I leaned out onto my toes, and that kind of made me flinch. And my arrow sailed a good two and a half feet left of my aiming point. And it, I, lucky enough, I put it right through the jugular, and that... I mean, that was spilled blood as as much as I've ever seen. No tracking. Right? No tracking. I think it was a red moon night too. I think it was yeah, like it a, was, just it was the, the ultimate. Yeah. Like, right in the throat patch. It, no, it was below the throat, <laughs> throat patch. Throat it was, it was, it was, it was Great deer. Yeah, it was a good deer, well, but it was... Uh, I'd rather have that shot than a lot of other slow ones. So yeah. You know, that's that's a great, great point actually with, you know, tree stand placement we always preach about eliminating variables and they just, I just had an, a, a circumstance like this a few weeks ago and I was with somebody out on their property and they were showing me this tree stand and, and the tree stand was set up on the direct back of the tree to where this new road was coming through, like four wheeler trail. Like the deer are going to walk down through there and I'm looking at that stand and I'm like, man, that looks like a recipe for disaster. And they're like, what do you mean? Like you can, you can shoot that easy. And I'm like, Hmm, just looks not good. So he actually climbed up in the tree. He's like, look, and, he, and it was that same scenario. He's like, I can lean around the tree and get him like this. Now, I'm not saying you can't make that shot, but what I'm saying is, man, that, that throws another whole variable into that deal than, than you need. Like set up your stand so that you have a comfortable shot to where you think you're going to be shooting. And then when that deer comes in, I've seen it so many times just from filming, like be patient, read the deer's body language. There's so many, we get amped up, right? And we get buck fever and deer's coming in and we got to get them killed as quick as we can. And when that happens, it's, it's really easy to make a bad decision or a bad shot because you're rushing or you're trying to, filming has made me such a more patient hunter because I'm always looking for that perfect shot, right? I, I'm always looking for him framed up perfectly and perfectly broadside and all this stuff. But when it comes down to it, if you're looking, reading the deer's body language, and you, you, you get in that spot where you slow yourself down and understand that you maybe don't have to kill that deer the first second that you have a shot at any kind of his vitals, let him get broadside, let him get quartered away just a hair, read the deer's body language and be patient and take a high percentage shot. Because if you focus on doing that, it's going to give you a lot higher odds of capitalizing on that shot opportunity. Yeah, And you don't want to make an unethical shot by any means, but I agree with you hundred percent, especially for us. Cause we're out, I mean, 
we don't have anybody in stand with us filming 90% of the time. When you're self filming, that's another added added avenue that you have to figure out during the situation as it's unfolding in front of you. And when you have to, like I was showing you in the footage on that throat punch bucket, I was leaned out as far as I possibly could without falling out of the tree stand. And that last little rock, you, you, I mean, having your feet flat, stable on the, on the stand, it's makes a night, night and day difference on how secure and anchored your shot is. I don't want to be the safety guy, but put that lifeline and safety yeah. harness in the tree too. Cause yeah. I don't know the more, the more I hunt, the more I get sketched out about that kind of, especially yeah. leaning out. I mean, you might've been tied in, but I don't know. Just be careful. Yeah. It's not, it's not worth it. You know, I can remember the no. days, you know, as a younger kid, man, you, you, yeah. you think you're a monkey up there and you're jumping around your hanging stands and you're doing all this stuff. And it's just, it can take two seconds, yeah. right? a second to, to clip in and, yeah. you know, climb up there and, and make sure that you're safe because it happens too fast. We all have families and, and, uh, definitely make sure that you're, you're being safe out there. Number one. Well, that's, and you, yeah. Important. And you hear stories about it every year and it's just, yeah, it's, it's a sad situation when somebody goes paralyzed or even lose your life falling out from 20 feet up in the tree, hitting your head on a limb on the way down but the stories come in every year of people doing it, and there's so much you can do to prevent that. We can dive into some tree stand yeah. topics. Yeah. <clears throat> As you were kind of talking about that setup that your buddy had or that individual had where he's on the backside of the tree, um, it's got me thinking. I know certain people like to be on the backside of the tree. I know Andy, and he likes to be on the backside, really conceal himself from the deer. And that makes a lot of sense. It is really hard. He doesn't self film, so that's maybe one of the reasons why he's got a cameraman also on the backside. I try to get more on the front side and then have more trees in front of me, like another barrier. So I'm not like the end tree on a wood edge or like, you know, super exposed. I'm always trying to get that one or two kind of breaking out my outline in the front. And then I know a tip Rod gave me, quite a few years back when I was down filming him during the rut one year, he's just doing like laps around the tree, kind of looking up. So if you can walk around and it's hard right now, cause you don't want to walk all over the place and put your scent out, but seeing if that tree is, is going to be good skyline wise or not. So like what's the backdrop and just kind of walk some of the main trails and really see like what that silhouette looks like. Like if you're sticking out of the side and it's just sky behind you, like the bad situation, maybe you can stick out the side, but there's a big, you know, burly, bur oak or white oak on the background and then you know it makes all the difference in the world so looking at like foreground background and then if you are filming you know you need a lot of the action out in front of you so it's almost better to kind of face that direction if you can especially self filming but you know it's hard this time of the year early season i'll be still setting a couple stands especially over in wisconsin and i know that i got to be careful because if i start trimming too many lanes now they're going to be wide open in november so Always best to do it in the spring if you can. I've filmed in some of them. <laughs> some are already wide open, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I've filmed in some of your stands, one I can think of in particular. And I remember getting up there and going, uh, Two are, are, are there any shooting lanes here? <laughs> <laughs> that was a different. Well, yeah. yeah. So, no, you filmed out of two, right? So you filmed yeah. out of the one on the west edge, right. and then you filmed out of the one Sabin. Yeah. So, what were those like? Uh, well, they're the, both, they were both heavy yeah, cover. Very heavy. And, well, I, and I, I can yeah. remember, and he was more of a, a new hunter. And I remember thinking to myself like, holy smokes, like they were tiny windows and you were going to squeeze one through there or you weren't getting a shot. And now you were super concealed up there, but, uh, they were, they were very minimally trimmed. I probably would have trimmed a, a little more, but, uh, so what am I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say this and you talk about front cover versus back cover. I was out filming Rick Cruder here actually this summer and we were filming a, just like a, a how to kind of video and he does a lot of Western hunting, right? A lot of stuff from mostly stuff from the ground and spot and stock muleys and, and elk and even whiteies, you know, from, from the ground. And he said something that he's learned from all his experiences are just remember back cover is better. And, you know, he, he would always make sure that, you know, you obviously want to have some cover on both. But if he was going to err on the side of having front cover versus back cover, it would always be back cover. And that's hunting from the ground. And I think we can use that same theory 
for tree stand hunting. And especially it can be a little tougher because you're dealing with the skyline deer looking up at you. Um, but don't disregard, you know, it's great. You can, it, it, you can provide some of that front cover, even in your tree stand, you may cut a few branches or, you know, something like that and stick them in the front of your stand or zip tie them, or, you know, you can create that front cover and that's great, but do not forget that back cover. It's like when we're turkey hunting, right? Like you sit with your back up against a tree. So you have that back cover because they can pick off movement way easier when there's openness behind you. So get somewhere where, you know, hopefully you're not skyline and you have that back cover behind you. And I don't know what you guys' opinion is on this, but after the acorns drop, this kind of falls into the back cover. After the acorns drop, I try to put a majority of my stands in red oak trees because they are usually the last to lose leaves on the year. Um, and over the years, I mean, you can get tucked up into an oak tree where, I mean, you're looking from the ground and you can't see 360 degrees around it, but you cut your shooting windows up above 10, 15 feet. That deer's not going to see unless it's 50 yards out, you know, and you're moving around doing jumping jacks. But those red oaks are always the last trees traditionally here in the Midwest to drop their leaves. And that's usually in the, the mid to late part of December when they start dropping their leaves. So that's, I mean, that's the biggest key that I picked up on through the red oaks is having that back cover. And you are absolutely sealed in. And with that osseo, that new osseo camel pattern, you feel like you melt right into that tree bark. Yeah, shot my buck. Those are my favorite trees, red oak, yeah. black oak here. And then shot my buck last year out of skyscraper out of a tiny little red oak tree i don't know if you've seen that tree stand or not at that at that spot but that's, that's pretty, tiny yeah, tree that's pretty sketchy tree. but i had a good you know limbs going all over the yeah. place really the only tree you could get in because they're all tiny but yeah it held this leaves really well um in wisconsin i think it's a pin oak i think it's a version it's like the black oak and then it goes to pin up there because those hold through february march like they hold the entire year so like you get into one of those trees up where I hunt in Wisconsin, it's like just bulletproof because it's like you're in the only yeah. tree with leaves in the whole section of woods. It's like a big bush. You yeah, just tuck your way in there. On Phenomenal. The on the flip side of that, though, you don't want to be hunting in that early season because the acorns are dropping right at your feet and the deer are down underneath looking up, I mean, through the limbs at you at the base of your tree stand. Yeah, yeah I, I think you have to be when it comes to tree stand placement. I mean, obviously, we're talking about perfect situations here where you have some of those bigger oak trees, and that's a, that's a great option. Um, but I think you have to be advantageous compared to, or based on where you hunt too, you know, like sure. I, I remember the days, you know, growing up with my dad hunting and it was like, man, we had to get, you know, 30 feet in the tree and you had to be as high as possible. And, you know, I look back on those days and I'm like, you know, wasn't necessary. It's you use what you can, you know, what you have access to, and then you kind of create, you try to melt into whatever scenario that is. Take, I know you've done it, JJ, and I, rising is surgical at it. You know, you see rising shoot so many deer from eight, 10 feet off the ground, and he's melding into these little cedar trees or whatever it is, but he's got some back cover. He's cutting out little holes where he's, he's slipping into, not hunting very high, but, you know, using what he's got and just making sure that he creates, has that cover around him. And shoot, you don't have to go 30 feet in the air to be successful. There's not really anybody that I've seen that does it better than rising as far as low-hanging tree stands. Yeah, those cedars, he, he yeah. pops in. It's, that's tough because yeah. the deer can go. It's not like they're funneling through a specific spot. Like if you're in a big right. cedar flat, they can get behind you easy. Yep. So for him to pull that off the past many years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over and over is pretty impressive. But your trees out east when you're hunting as a kid, those were tall. Like that timber is more straight no yeah. limbs yeah. tall like. and, yeah and that's just it like we hunted out of climbers a lot you know out east and you know it, it it would be not very difficult to go in in the morning with a headlamp you know very low key and find a straight tree and be able to climb up in a climber here it's a little tougher to do like you're yeah. not just taking your climber out oh there's a straight tree and All climbing right. up it you know yeah you gotta prep it yeah well we're running out of time here. I think there's some some pretty cool information there. Obviously, I gotta I gotta get out of here because I gotta go get in a tree stand. I'll text yep. you guys and you can live vicariously through me. But uh, yep. um, exciting times! Deer season is here. Um, keep your eye out for hunt breakdowns launching every week. Some really really cool hunts coming up. Um, if you haven't checked out the ones previously, um, some really good stuff there too. So, good luck whoever's out there hunting early season. Um, stay tuned. 
uh, Deer Society YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Download the free Deer Society app. Lots of great content on there. If you're thinking about calling and wondering, well, should I call early? Should I call mids? We have lots of instructionals out there right on the Deer Society app and lots of good podcast content about calling, especially early season, mid season, late season, and how you can put the odds in your favor. Uh, so good luck out there hunting. Thanks for listening. And uh, hopefully we got some big buck action coming your way here soon. Well, I'm a deer. All our sponsors here at Deer Society are partners whose equipment we know we can trust are going to make you more successful and have a better experience in the field. Products like Illusion Systems, maker of the Black Rack, the Extinguisher, and the Phase Body Odor System. Tacticam, Reveal Cell Cameras, 10-Point Crossbows, Onyx Maps, Osseo Gear, Huyman, and Big Frig.